It looks like we have uh, people in the room. I will go ahead and say good evening, everyone. Thank you and welcome to the workshop, Social Media for Neighborhoods. So for those of you who have joined us, I'm gonna ask that you go ahead and put your neighborhood in the chat so we can see who's represented here. Sheffield Parks in the house. Beckton Park, all right. Reed Meadows, everybody can see that as it's coming through. I'm going to go ahead and finish the introduction as we wait for others to enter their information. I'm so glad that you're here with us this evening. My name is Cynthia Woods. I'm with the City of Charlotte's Housing and Neighborhood Development Department, Housing and Neighborhood Services Department, and I'm in the Community Engagement Division. We have joining us tonight as presenters two wonderful people from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library, their DigiLit team. And we're also excited to have a neighborhood representative, Chad, from the Villa Heights community. He's going to show you some things that they do with their social media so you can get information from a neighborhood's perspective. I also, also see Reed Meadows is here. Hopefully others will join us. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should go ahead and proceed if that's okay with all of you. All right, I see head nods. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about this um, workshop. We're conducting it as a webinar um, so that we can put it on our website and offer it as an on-demand training session for those who couldn't be here tonight. You can go to our website, pull it up, and get this training. You are being recorded, or I should say the webinar is being recorded. Don't panic. You are not recorded. Uh, your camera is off by default, and so is your, um, you're muted as well. So you would not appear, you would not be visible in the recording, except for those who are speaking. We're asking that uh, if we can, We'll hold the questions till the end of the session, just in the interest of time. But if you do have a burning question that you need to get to us, please use the Q&A box. We will, from time to time, ask you questions, and we'd like you to put those responses in the chat. So that's the difference there. It'll be much easier for us to track your questions if they're in the Q&A box. So I mentioned that we have um, guest presenters. Porta, Portia Jita is a library assistant at the Hickory Grove branch on the DigiLit team, and I understand she just joined the team. Um, we also have Hillary Swirk, also with the Public Library uh, and Adult Services and Online Programs, and Mr. Chad Mackey. He's the social media manager for the Villa Heights Community Organization. You'll hear more from them a little further into the session. You may recall that when you registered, uh, we asked you to answer some questions for us so we, we could meet you where you are in your experience with social media. We thought we'd let you know a little bit of what, about what those results showed us. 69% of you are at least somewhat comfortable using social media. A nice handful of people said they're very comfortable and we also had someone who's not comfortable at all, but hopefully this will help you get to where you want to be. When we ask how you use social media personally, most people said Facebook, but next door was a close second. And it was the opposite in terms of how your neighborhoods use social media. Next door was the most popular response. And then Facebook, again, a close second. Some things that you told us you want to learn how to do. Um, this is just a summary. Most of them 
were dealing with connecting and engaging with the community, gathering and sharing appropriate information. Uh, one person wanted to host intergenerational hands-on experiences, which sounds exciting. Uh, we have people who want to know how to manage a Facebook page, also structure posts and make the information interesting. If you have anything to add that doesn't fit into one of those categories, go ahead and put it in the chat box for us. Okay, I don't see anything coming in, so I'm going to assume that that pretty much covers it. Our workshop objectives. Um, we're going to help you learn how your neighborhood can benefit from using social media, discuss some best practices for reaching your neighbors using those three platforms, review some tips and tools to create newsletters, and explore resources so you can continue learning. This workshop is scheduled for an hour and a half. So, of course, we can't tell you everything you would need to know in that time frame, but we do want to make sure that you know where, where you can go to get additional help. So what is social media and how can your neighborhood benefit from using it? We went to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, so we would be able to get it exactly right for you. Uh, social media forms of electronic communication, such as websites or social networking and microblogging, through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content, such as videos. So how can your neighborhood benefit from using it? I'm sure all of you have your own answers for that. That's why you're here today, to learn more about it. But uh, if you look at that, that um, dictionary explanation, the words sort of pop out at you, communication, networking, communities, information sharing, personal messages. This is the day and age that there's such a, everything moves so fast. Uh, everybody wants to be able to communicate. And that's important for all neighborhoods. I've never worked with a neighborhood who said they could not stand to improve their communication. And social media is a quick and relatively simple way of doing that. Uh, you can reach out to people to ask what they think about an upcoming project. You can share important events and dates. And you can also uh, share fun things like pictures. Some who've been in um, neighborhood leadership for a while might even remember the days that you had to wait until the next neighborhood meeting to share information with people or rely on block captains or other volunteers to hand out flyers. Well, those days are gone pretty much. You can now get that information out quickly and easily. I'm going to hand it over to Hillary now, and she's going to get into a little bit more detail. Hey everybody, I'm happy to be here with you tonight and uh, see you know a couple people from different neighborhoods. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about a few popular social media sites um, for your neighborhoods. Um, so all of these platforms are similar, but we wanted to point out just a few key distinctions between them. Um, first up is um, Facebook. So um, Facebook is a social media and social networking site. Um, that allows you to connect and share with other individuals and groups online. Um, you have the ability to post pictures, links, event information, um, and other updates through Facebook, which makes it a really great platform to share information with your neighborhood. The next one we're going to talk about is Instagram. Um, this is, again, another social networking site um, with the simple goal of sharing photos and videos to get your information out. Um, so it's a great option to share some quick updates and visually grab the attention of your neighbors on Instagram if you want to share out some information. 
Um, and then the next one we're going to talk about is Nextdoor. So this one is specifically for networking um, for neighborhoods. And uh, because it's geared towards neighborhoods, um, it can be a great tool to share out information like um, getting local service recommendations um, and connecting with your neighbors. And Cynthia, if you could go to the next slide. We do have another question that we wanted to pose to you and have you answer in the chat. Um, we'd like to know which social media sites you currently use to communicate with your neighborhood. Um, and I think you might have answered this in the survey that was sent out when you registered, um, but we'd love to have you share it again with us. Um, kind of so we can see which ones that you use to communicate if you want to drop those. All right, so I see Facebook. And we know that Nextdoor was another popular one that was used to Nextdoor. Mm -hmm. And if anybody else wants to share it, you can uh, go ahead and feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but I think we can go to the next slide and continue. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so this next slide is um, a list of questions that we um, wanted to pose to you um, just to really get you thinking about your neighborhood and your social media sites that you use, um, whether you already have one or if you're in the process of setting one up. Um, so these questions are meant to get you thinking about how you reach your neighborhood, how you manage your social media platforms, and how you really maintain them in the long term. So we'll just run through these. And if you have any thoughts that you would like to share along the way, please feel free to type those in the chat and share with your neighbors who and your community that are here tonight, um, because it's always great to share our tips and things uh, for using social media. So the first question that we wanted to pose is, how do you choose a social media platform? Did you or have you polled your neighbors? Um, so if you already have an email list of neighbors or a current social media site, um, you could do something like send out a simple free survey to get a better feel um, for the social media that your neighbors currently use or would most likely access. Um, you could also do something like take a poll at your next in-person or virtual um, neighborhood meeting when you actually see everyone's in your neighborhood, just to get a better idea of what you know, if you have one already, do we need to expand it? Um, just thinking about those questions for your group. Um, and you can create a lot of uh, free online polls using things like Google Forms, Microsoft Forms, SurveyMonkey, or MailChimp, just to name a few. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about a lot of different um, options for you to communicate tonight. And those are just a few that we know have some free options. The next question we wanted to pose is, do you have a general email account dedicated to your neighborhood group instead of an individual person? So just getting uh, you to think about, you know, having that general email account that can be helpful for your neighborhood group because it won't be tied to that one person who manages it. Um, access could be shared with more than one administrator in case someone decides to move on or pass on those duties in the future. So this way, uh, the likelihood of losing access to your social media sites uh, or accounts and losing um, any of your neighborhood contacts that you've built up um, in the long term, long term would be decreased. Um, so just thinking about those questions again. The next question we have is who has administrative access and who will help you monitor your accounts? This is especially important to think about when setting up those social media accounts for your neighborhood. Um, it can be helpful to have a backup person who can not only access the accounts, but help you answer those questions as they come in and help you monitor what's being posted and shared so you can respond and really be engaged with your community members. The next question we want to pose is, do you want your neighborhood group to be public or private? Um, 
So for this one, you want to think about how you'll be using the neighborhood social media group or page and the type of information you're going to be sharing. Um, so for example, if you have a Facebook account set up to share official neighborhood business and announcements, then you could consider setting it up as a private group. So this requires individuals to actually submit the request to join your group and be able to view it. However, if you wanted to share more general information like community and event information and pictures from your events or things going on in the neighborhood, then you could consider making it public, um, which could attract some new residents um, to join your organization if they're able to see it on that public page. So another thing to think about. The next question we wanted to pose is, do you have guidelines for what can and what should be shared on your sites? So this uh, kind of goes for both you yourself as the administrator and the conduct of what your neighborhood members are posting. Um, so thinking about setting up expectations, um, this, this can be a great way to avoid any of those unwanted posts or soliciting um, and keeping that off of your neighborhood page. Um, and just keeping all of your goals for what you share on the page really consistent. Um, you'd include those guidelines um, up front in the uh, description of your account or page that others can see like immediately when they access it, just to keep that top of mind. Um, so for example, if you want people to not post um, things about selling items or having items that are like for free to drop off at the curb, um, you know, if you want people to keep their language clean on your site or try to, um, then you could include a statement about being respectful of your neighbors and kind of adhering to like all of those um, asks and being respectful of people's privacy and things like that. And Portia is also gonna share a little more about this in some of our upcoming slides. And then finally, <laughs> I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at you guys, but the last questions we have for you to think about is do you have a plan to pass on the responsibility, responsibility and information. We kind of touched on this a little bit in some of those previous questions, but basically thinking about how the social media accounts will be accessed if you decide to pass on those duties or if you ever become unavailable to uh, maintain them. So you wouldn't want the neighborhood to lose the ability to update um, or maintain your social media pages or your emails and things like that if you get so many followers and contacts built up. So, Lots to think about as you're planning um, your social media pages. <clears throat> this next slide, um, we just wanted to reiterate uh, a few quick distinctions between having your group and your personal page. So um, these concepts would really apply across all of the social media um, platforms that we're gonna touch on tonight, um, especially Facebook, uh, these concepts would apply to, but um, we just wanted to kind of reiterate the difference between your group page being an opportunity to connect with others that share similar interests um, and allowing you to connect with your own community. And then that personal page being, uh, you know, your page that represents yourself where you have all your personal information, your contacts, your friends and family and kind of separating both of those as you're thinking of having your neighborhood group and your personal pages. Um, just one quick note that you do need to have a personal page, especially for Facebook, in order to create a group page first, and then vice versa. If you have your personal page already set up, like through Facebook, you will have the ability to view and join other groups. Um, so just wanted to point out those few distinctions as we move forward tonight. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> okay, um, guys, I'm Portia. Um, thanks, Hillary. She gave us information on how to start Facebook and the social medias. I'm going to give you best practices once you begin to set up your um, accounts. So we want to start with Facebook first. Uh, Facebook is, of course, like uh, the survey said, most people use Facebook more than the other social media platforms. So once you do set up your group, um, the best practices to maintain your neighborhood um, would be, of course, to send out invites for people to join. You need members in the group. Um, it gives you two options. You can use either their email, personal emails, or you can search by their names. However, if you decide to search the person by the name, they do have to have a Facebook account because um, that's the only way to come up. Um, if not, it'll probably be best recommended that you use your email. Um, second would be to 
activate membership or post approval requirements. Normally when you send out the invite to them, it has them accepted. Um, it, you can set it up as giving them rules too as well before they come into the group. Um, once they accept it on their end, it will send you uh, approval requirement notification. Um, you just have to go in and approve or decline um, their member membership into the group. You don't, some people, I don't think there will ever be a reason why you decline somebody, but it may be. Um, third, your third best practice is to have administrators to the group. Um, the administrators can help facilitate the group and keep things in order. It's best that you have more than one because then it, everything won't fall on that one person. It gives the access, I mean, giving access to others can help alleviate some of the pressure of just having one person keeping up with everything as far as post um, requirement or approval, excuse me. Having at least three admins will ensure that nothing is missed in the group. Fourth, create rules. Most groups do have rules. Like Hillary said, it's it's set to keep, it sets a tone for the group so that you make sure everyone is being respectful. Um, it prevents member conflict as well. Um, and when they go to accept the membership, you can have the rules, you can set it up as they have to accept the rules before they get into the group. So that, that's just the way to make sure everybody has read the rules so no one can say they didn't know. Um, and of course, you always want to spread the word. Spreading the word about the group is a great way to bring members as well. You can add the group name to like a newsletter in the community, or if you have meetings, you can post it at the pool house, um, different things like that. Word of mouth probably is the most popular. Um, the last one is to just be active and present. Um, in the group, as an admin, you want to make sure you're participating in conversations making comments on the post. Um, you can also create a, like a, I guess like a newsletter and you can post it into the group. You can do weekly member spotlights. Um, you can tag each other, create posts that relates to events that's happening to the, in the community like yard sales, if you have social parties. Um, you could post safety and security information as well. Um, but I think that is, you can go to the next one. This is just a um, quick two minute video of, it shows you how to set up the group. We give you more tips on what to do after the group is set up. Um, so it's a quick little video. It has a lot of important information. In Hello, this is a guide on how to start a Facebook group for your neighborhood association. Build your association membership. Facebook groups can connect neighbors and be a useful tool to share information and create a community. This guide will help you get a jump start to create a Facebook group. Facebook groups have great functions. Your group can be closed to the public and open only to your association members or neighborhood residents. You can post documents, create polls, share resources with one another, and also have group chats. Members are always notified when anything new is posted. First, choose a name. Log into your Facebook page and choose Create Group under the drop-down menu in the upper right corner. Use the full name of your association, not an abbreviation. Add people to your group. Choose the group setting public or closed is probably best so that more residents can see what's posted. Add a cover photo and select the group type neighbors. Next, set guidelines. Write your guidelines in your group description or pin a post with your guidelines or create a guidelines document. Select other group members to be admins or moderators for your group. Admins or moderators can approve posts or remove posts that violate the group guidelines. And just get started. Facebook group is a powerful tool that neighborhood associations can leverage to create more engagement with residents. This quick guide was meant to get you kickstarted with creating your group. There are many details not covered here that you will only learn by doing it and then reading more articles available on the Facebook help page. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like some more help, please email us at neighborhoods at san antonio.gov. Okay, guys, that was a, just a quick video, video of how to set it up.
Um, here's some screenshots of once you set Facebook is once you you have to create a personal page first. And once you created your personal page at the top, you have home, friends, and groups. Um, you will click on groups. Once you click on groups, that takes you to step two. Um, on the left side of the page, or it will be a panel. You click on create a group. From there, it will take you to step three. Now, once you create the group, you will see your name. You can put in your community's name. You can choose. You have two options uh, for privacy. It's either public or private. If you do public, it allows anyone on and off Facebook to see what the members post, comment, and share in the group. If you choose private option, it will allow the members to see what is members in the group to only see what is posted, comments, and shared in the group. Most neighborhoods choose private just because you want to see who's in and coming in and out of the group. Um, I did a search. There are a few that do public, but most most of the time the privacy level is private. You can go to the next one. So this is once the group is created, this is what the, um, the layout would look like. You have on oh, number one is the edit button, um, which you can edit your profile. You can change the picture. That is just I did the simple picture. That's just what comes up once you create a group. Um, you can change it to your communities um, if you have a symbol or sign, or you can do a picture of the beginning of the neighborhood. Um, this is what everyone, when they search for your group, this is the cover photo that will show. So it is best that you use a photo that is the direct reference to the community. Um, most community groups will use, the, like I said, the picture of an entrance of the neighborhood, their logo or anything like that. Um, now Facebook will automatically default to that. So you do have to go in and change it with the edit. And then number two is where you go to send out the invites. Um, like I stated before, you can either do it by email, their personal emails, or you can do um, their names and they have to have a Facebook profile for it to pop up. So as they receive the invites, you can manage the group from the left side panel where number three is. Um, this area has multiple usage. You can approve the non-member requests. You can um, schedule posts. You can also deny and approve the post that the members of the group um, post as well. You don't have to set it up that way. So it's up, totally up to you. Um, you can add membership questions. So they have to answer the questions before they join the group. In order to become a member, you can create group rules. You can change the group settings. Um, there's also a feature called the Admin Assist. Um, it's a tool that allows you to save time, keep the community safe by setting a custom criteria that would automatically manage posts. So you don't necessarily have to go in and approve anything, you can set it up for the group to do it on its own. Um, you can also set like um, the admin assist to schedule posts. It also manages conflict. Um, it reports certain members if they're um, using foul language or different things like that. And then number four is also where you can see um, members, you can see discussions, you can change different things in that panel as well. You go to the next one. All right, um, I'll give you a little break. I know we've done a lot of talking. If you have any questions, any tips to share about how you use your Facebook for your neighborhood group, um, you can throw it in the chat for us. I'll give you a couple seconds for anyone to type. Tom, I'll, we'll keep it moving. If you have any questions, just let us know. All right, I think one just came through. Oh, Vanessa said she posts neighborhood grant events. That's a good idea. I didn't think about that. Um, so we'll move on to um, Instagram. Instagram is a little different from Facebook. The major difference is that Instagram is primarily pictures, whereas Facebook it's a platform where you can share information through posts and comments. You don't necessarily have to post pictures, you can, but Instagram is more picture based. 
So when it comes to establishing a presence on Instagram, the goal of the community is to share how they they love and support one another. Um, you can create this account using the community's email. So therefore access to the account is available to whoever has that login information. You may have people come and go. Um, you have to change who controls it. So if you do a basic community email and a password, that information can be, can be passed along easily. Now, once you do have that account established, here's some best practices that keep it um, going and maintain. First, Using a picture of the neighborhood or signage in the profile is a way you can connect with the followers. Um, Instagram is pitch, mostly pictures, so that's what they will see if they search your name. So that it gives them the, um, it, they automatically know that it's the right community that they're searching for. Also, when you're setting up the profile, it allows you to do a what they call a bio, which is a biography about the community. Um, now, you are only allowed to 150 characters, so the best practice is to keep it simple and straightforward. You can draw attention to the biography by adding emojis and hashtags as well. Now, also to remain relevant, posting three to seven times weekly um, on your Instagram page, it engages your followers, it lets them know that you're still there. Um, it also gives you a chance to respond to their comments as well. Um, if they want to post anything, it gets your, your number of followers up. A three, limit limited use of hashtags and have fun with emojis. Hashtags and emojis are a great way to catch the followers' attention. So a hashtag pretty much is a word or a phrase preceded by a hashtag sign, um, mostly used on social media platforms. The rule of thumb with hashtags, though, is not to do more than six. Um, and it can be anything. It can be like hashtag have fun, hashtag live life, um, anything in reference to the photo that you're posting. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to have a certain format. You could just kind of make them up as you go. Um, now, next is when you're editing the profile, you can you can add a link into the um, excuse me, add a link for your community's website or newsletter into the bio. It's, it's called um, well in Instagram world, it's called link in bio, bio strategy. So once you do put your website out there, if you post or post to your stories. You can just say check the link in the bio or check the you can do you don't necessarily have to do your community's website it could be to any event that you may be having it's just an easy way to have people go to your profile click the link and then it takes them to the page where they can get all their questions answered or if they need to ask you anything about it they can um now next is Facebook and um, Instagram kind of go hand in hand you can connect your neighborhood group to your Instagram um, you do it, it's, it's easy. You can do it from your profile. You, the person who's over the Facebook group would have to do it because Facebook is set up a little different from Instagram. So once you get it connected, you can post from Instagram automatically to your Facebook, if that makes sense. Um, you can do it from posts. You can do it from your stories. So it'll go it's versus you posting in both places. You can do it in one and just connect it to your Facebook. Um, now, lastly, you can experiment with the Instagram stories and Instagram live. Anything posted to the story will appear for 24 hours. You can share videos, you can share pictures as well. Um, it's always at the top of your homepage. Um, whoever you're following or your followers will, will be able to see it and you can see their stories as well. Um, Instagram live is another tool, a great tool to utilize because you say if you have an event um, like a trick or tr tr um, trunk or treat for Halloween, you can go live to show people this is where we are, come out, have fun, and um, get some candy for the kids. But you can do it with anything with live. You go to the next one. Okay, so this is just an example, excuse me, of um, I set up a fake Instagram for a neighborhood, Madison Oaks. Yours may look different. So number one, it shows the um, the title of the neighborhood, the bio that we were talking about. Um, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be the whole 150 characters. You can do one line, live life, come join our community. Um, I added some emojis in there as well. Um, the link in the bio strategy is also below it. So I don't know if you can really see it. it. It's just pretty much a website and it's a hyperlink. So the person can click on it and it takes you to that website. Um, number two is I did one post. This is where your posts will go. 
um, it was just, um, I think it was a picture from my trip last week or last month, excuse me. Um, that's where you can do hashtags as well. The second picture is, I made it bigger, um, how it have your name of your pro, your community. You can make um, a status. You don't have to necessarily. I added the emojis as as well to get the followers attention and a couple of hashtags. Okay, you can go to the next one soon. All right, guys, I know we went over a lot of information. If you have any tips to share about how you use your Instagram for your neighborhood groups or any questions, you can throw them in the chat. You go to the next one. Or did we have a chat? No. I think there is a, a question that popped up in Q and A, and it says, "What is the purpose or benefit of using hashtags?" So when you use hashtags, it takes it and kind of groups it into, um, I guess, like a different page. Like on Instagram, you can search hashtags. So if you click the search button, search button and you type in the hashtag that you use, everyone on Instagram that has ever used that hashtag, it'll show you all of their pictures and videos using that hashtag. So it's easy to find different topics as well. So if you're looking like hashtag celebration, 4th of July celebration, if you type that in, it's going to bring up every one of your followers who's used that hashtag and what they're doing when they when they posted it, if that makes sense. Awesome, that's a great uh, explanation, Portia. <laughs> I was scared I was gonna explain that wrong. <laughs> no, it was great. It's a beautiful explanation. I love searching hashtags sometimes too. I usually do it when I am posting things. I'm like, what is everybody else posting? So yeah, very great question. Too. Thank you for asking that one too, Tasha. Great question. So we're gonna move on to our next platform, um, which is Nextdoor. Nextdoor is a little different from Facebook and Instagram. Um, once you set up your account, you choose the community that you're in. Um, it will, I believe it automatically sets it up for you when you type in your information as far as zip code. So here's some best practices once you do create your account. Um, of course, be respectful to your neighbors. Um, these are really your real life neighbors in your community. Um, there have been some arguments I've seen on Nextdoor before. Um, it's Nextdoor is a very big on their privacy and far as being respectful. So if they feel that you're not being respectful, it will kick you out of the system and ban you from using Nextdoor, uh, which brings us to the next one, do not discriminate. Um, don't use any racial, um, anything that's harmful to um, one another that hurts the next person. Um, also, you can promote, you can use Nextdoor to promote like local commerce. Um, that's pretty much if you're selling something, some neighbors do, they may have like a bed set or something that they wanna sell or they wanna give away for free. Um, you can post that on there. I've seen a lot of people post um, lost pets um, there have been some missing children or children that have ran away. Um, I've seen that as well. So you can just post different things. Um, you do, once you sign up for it, you do have to use your true identity, which means use your, you're using your real name. Um, they, I don't know if they can, it's any way for them to really tell, but they ask that you do use your, um, real name as far as when you're signing up. It doesn't give your your um, identity away or anything. Um, most of the time people can't even see your address. They just see the area that you are in. Another big best practice was do not engage in harmful activity. Um, things such as sexual harassment, har harassment to people, um, using foul language against your neighbors. Um, all of this is actually listed in, I included the next door privacy policy that you can click. Um, it'll tell you everything. They are big on privacy. I know a lot of people don't like to give out the information, um, but Nextdoor is very secure as well. And you go to the next one. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of my, ne my Nextdoor neighbor, um, Nextdoor neighbor, excuse me, Nextdoor 
app um, homepage. The first one just shows once you um, log in, create your account, it's your homepage. So you have um, the news feed in the middle, shows you what your neighbors are posting, and you have the option as well. On the left-hand side, it's called Discover. You can type in different things, like see if Charlotte has a page. Um, you can type in different neighborhoods. You don't necessarily have to only see your neighborhood. You can join other groups as well. And then number two is just a screenshot of your, um, of, excuse me, of the Discover page. So once you click on the Discover from the first screenshot, um, this is how it will change. It will also give you recommendations of what neighborhoods are near that you may want to join. Um, you can post, excuse me, you can see ads as well. So if a city of Charlotte posts something, it more than likely will pop up in your ads. So you can click, you can just scroll through different neighborhoods and join different things. Do we have a, I see chat has a question. Oh, okay, it's not to the thing. Can answer that later. Okay, so um, any tips to share about how you use your Nectar for your neighborhood group? Um, you can also put them in the chat as well. I'll give you a couple, couple seconds. I know I threw a lot, a lot of information at you, so if anything does come up, just let us know. Um, you can put it in the chat as well, and we'll try our best to answer. You can go to the next one, Hillary. I think this next slide is Cynthia, who is going to just turn it over to Chad Mackey. Uh, yes, we're welcoming Chad, who is the social media manager for the Villa Heights Community Organization. Take it away, Chad. Hey, thanks, Cynthia, and thanks, uh, Portia and Hillary. Um, that was some good information. I, what I thought I would show, and if you if you will end your share, I can share some stuff um, or take over or however we want to work it. Um, I took over the social media for Villa Heights about it, not quite a year ago. We have an amazing president, Chantel Morales. I'm not sure if she's on, but um, she's kind of the heart and soul of our neighborhood. But we have a very active community and we have a very open social media um, uh, presence. So we don't do groups, but we do Facebook pages. We have a Facebook page where we post and post information. We use Instagram and then a little bit of Twitter. Um, and then because you can't have a neighborhood page on next door, you have to be an individual next door. We don't, we don't have a presence there, but we'll post a couple of the board members will post up there um, from time to time. So I thought I'd take you through a couple of things, but please, I think the most value here would be to ask questions or if there's something that you're thinking about that, that maybe I'm not saying, please, please let me know. Okay, great. Um, so this is our, our Facebook page in Villa Heights. If you, if you create a page, it's, Facebook is built to sell ads. <laughs> so pages will get, a, you'll get a lot of information about your page, but they'll, it'll be very focused on you trying to monetize that kind of, because a lot of businesses will have a page too. The cool thing though about Facebook, and we have Facebook and Instagram, if you had a page, they have a, a business suite that you'll see over here. I'm just going to point this out and then I'm going to take you to my phone. But the cool thing about the business suite is it has a lot of insights. So if you start building your posts on Facebook or you start building information on um, Instagram, you can come here and actually kind of get data about what those posts are generating and are they are people engaging on them. And we don't buy any ads. We've never put money into the social media world. We're just trying to communicate and connect the community but it will give you an idea of what works, what gets most interactions, um, what kind of people you have following you. So the Facebook over here on the left and the Instagram people on the right. Um, and then it gives you a kind of cool breakdown of ages um, and uh, gender as well. So it just gives you a, a little bit of insight into who you're connecting with and who your followers are from a social media perspective to get you a little bit informed. My and I'm I'm not an expert by any stretch. My humble opinion is 
um, younger folks tend to, to go toward Instagram more um, and, and people like my age, <laughs> um, Gen X uh, and baby boomers and other, other generations tend to stay more on Facebook. Um, and you can see a little bit of that in our in our data here. And so that's something you want to think about. We have a pretty diverse community. And so you want to try to meet people where they are, where they're going to be. So we we maintain a couple different sites so that hopefully we we reach everyone because people will have a preference. They want to be on Facebook or they want to be on Instagram. So that kind of helps. Um, from a uh, Instagram perspective, um, we we get more i don't know i'm not sure it could be the previous uh, social media folks we get more interest on villa on the villa heights instagram page or the instagram feed than we do with facebook so i tend to concentrate most content here because they're chad we lost your sound i think you're muted so sorry thank you for saying that um, I don't, was it just for a minute or like a long time? Just a couple seconds. You were telling us that you focus mostly on Instagram. Yeah, um, but because they're owned by the same company, Facebook now, uh, they're that when you post, it'll allow you to cross post on both platforms. Um, just be careful because the Facebook allows certain things like links and other information in their pro in their posts where face uh, where Instagram doesn't. So. Um, some things won't show up the same way on the on the cross platforms. Um, let me share. Let's see how this works. I was gonna because I I um, depending on how you manage your account, one of the things that um, that we I I do a lot and it takes a lot of time is um, is engage with people that are engaging on the site. So you, you are frequently monitoring your site to see if someone's responding to something or asking a question. Um, someone mentioned, you guys were talking about the hashtags. That's a great way to engage on Instagram um, because you can search for hashtags. And so I'll frequently go in here and search for Villa Heights um, and then search. And then you can go over here to tags and see who's tagged Villa Heights in their posts. So that, and I apologize if it's going too fast, but this will show you who's tagged Villa Heights, recent um, reels, et cetera. You can also do places. So if, if you're a neighborhood, that's a great place to look. So who's tagged the, the neighborhood Villa Heights in their posts? And then you can kind of see what all of those are, which is kind of cool. Um, so the, the tagging, tagging of information is pretty helpful. Um, the other thing I thought I'd share is just, and I'm sorry, I manage a couple accounts. I have a chorus. <laughs> um, the other thing that I thought I would point out is that the type of post you do can often influence who engages with it. So um, both on Facebook and Instagram, most people are going to react to images faster than they are plain text. And so I have a, um, like this post here, which is a silent auction for our Villa Heights Elementary School. We, we like to support them and share. Probably is not gonna get a lot of looks because it's black and white, it's, a, it's text, it has some other information. So it, that's probably not the best post. Um, some of the other ones like the community cleanups that we have, I try to make it visual and pop some images in there um, and we're giving away free t-shirts, which, which always helps. But um, that sometimes can help people see things. You're gonna always get most interactions when you actually post something uh, that has movement and video and people in it because people wanna see themselves or they wanna relate to what it is. And this, while I'm not necessarily sharing information in this one, it gives people an idea of what's going on in the community and gives people a sense of a community um, and, and can help people. And this is our neighborhood meeting that was earlier this week where we had pizza. Um, so those are a couple things. The other thing I thought I would share, if you're a real big mobile person, um, I do 95% of everything on my phone. Um, and there are some tools out there that um, some of them are free. Some of them cost a little bit of money, but Canva is a great one. 
um, this one in the top middle it to help you make designs and post things. I love Pixel Cut. I do have to pay a little bit of money or a subscription uh, to use it, um, but it helps you take take images, posts from places and kind of put them together. I am an amateur. I'm not a graphic artist. I, I, I all of this stuff I just kind of learned on the fly by using these little apps um, so that it helped me, excuse me, it helped me um, build up a little bit of knowledge in that space, but they're very handy. Um, GoDaddy Studio is another one, and then Adobe Express, the other one here is a, a, a big one that a lot of people use. But what you could do with these is quickly go in and create, create a post, um, and then you can see I have like all the posts that I've done over time and built and created, um, and you can size them, and, 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 and they usually have templates. So if you like come in here and scroll down, um, you can pick a template, but let's say you just want to do an Instagram square, you can click the square and then you can just begin um, editing it, adding pictures, text, etc. which is, I know a lot of information, but I thought I would share that because that's been um, a big deal for me is learning how to do that so that the posts become a little bit more um, interactive and engaging for folks. Um, let me pause there. Any questions or um, Hillary or Portia or any anything else, other questions or things that I could show that might be helpful? No, I feel like you covered all of it. Do you have a link in your bio? Yes, ma'am. So we have a, a link in our bio. The reason why we do that, as Portia mentioned, Instagram will not let you embed links in your posts. So if I tell them I want them to go to our Zoom link for our monthly meeting, I have to tell them to go to our LinkedIn bio, and then they can come here and click on it. It's also a great place to store links and stuff. Um, and a lot of people are used to that. So we just kind of put it there. And LinkedIn bio is um, it's a website you can go to, and it's for free. So it's lnk.bio, and you can sign up for it. And it'll give you a little tiny short link you can use, like this right here, um, and then put that in your Instagram uh, um, header or, or bio is what it's called. Oh, one more thing. Um, if you also, we really like to engage with our businesses around the community, and, and we have a school here. We also have a supportive uh, housing community here, McCreesh Place, that we partner with quite a bit. So we try to engage with them um, with all your social media. The more you tag other people and places, the better that's going to generate um, shares and likes. And so we do a lot to support our, 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 our community from a business perspective. We have business sponsors. So we, we have stories um, for those business sponsors. I don't think stories work in the web page. Oh, yeah, they did. It just take a minute. So for, for each of the businesses that sponsor it, we created a post for it. Um, and you can actually see um, who those businesses are and we tag them. And so that just plays out a little bit more, like you get a little bit more interaction with folks when they see that. Um, you get a little bit more connected to the community. All right. Can I have a quick question for you? Are yeah. you the sole administrator? Yeah, I am. Um, although Chantel does a great job, if she sees something um, and or something's coming up, she has access to it. So she'll post for me or she'll maybe she's at a, an event and I'm not the event. She she kind of backs me up. But um, I'm the I am the sole administrator um, and I, I would be lying if I didn't say it, it takes hours a week. But it's like a, a hobby for me. I just like and I like social media. So I scroll a lot and try to find events or community events or um, government things going on that the community might be interested in to share it. Mm -hmm. um, I also use Google Alerts. I don't know if you guys use those. Um, Google Alerts, if you just go to your uh, web page and type it in, it allows you to just subscribe to words or to phrases. So I subscribe to Villa Heights or I subscribe to something. And if, uh, if um, a news article has that phrase in it or that, that, that search term you've put in there, it'll send you an email. And then you, you like kind of get a, more, uh, like a message that there's an article about Villa Heights and the Charlotte Observer. Sometimes that's good, <laughs> sometimes that's not, but it, it gives you a little bit of ability to kind of um, get things sent to you versus you having to go out and search for stuff too. That's a great idea. 
Um, I don't see any questions in the Q and A or the chat, so um, is that what you needed to share with us, Chad? Yeah, unless there's other questions, um, really appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you folks, and I'm I'm available if anybody um, has other questions or anything else. I'm I'm happy to follow up through you. Okay, sounds sounds good. Yes, thank you very much. And if you think of other questions, um, uh, those of you in the audience, you can still put them in the chat. Um, Chad is going to hang around, and we will uh, continue. Oh, I do see some uh, questions popping up in the chat. Just really quickly, Ellen. Um, yes, Chad was talking about Google Alerts to sign up for um, different phrases or like your community so you can um, get alerts for what's going on if those words or phrases pop up and so you having to go out and search for them. Um, newsletters, neighborhood newsletters. You all may remember when you read the description of this workshop that we said we talk about social media and neighborhood newsletters. Uh, to be honest, when you completed the survey online during registration, nobody said you wanted to know anything about newsletters. So what I'm going to do is Hillary and I are going to skip quickly through this so we can get to the Q&A. Um, I feel obligated to go through it to some degree because we are recording this. Um, we'll go on to the next one. So um, if you have a newsletter, you probably have ideas about things that you can include. Actually, some of them are the, the things that Chad mentioned they include on their Facebook page and uh, Portia as well. Things like um, neighborhood news, of course, um, I believe Chad mentioned uh, government information. And since I work for the government, I'm going to reiterate that. Um, some people like to include fun things like uh, recipes, um, even uh, brain teasers or puzzles, things like that. You get the information from your neighbors. Um, you can also get information from neighborhood partners and stakeholders, similar to what Chad mentioned about the businesses in the neighborhood, um, how to distribute it. I received an, a newsletter not long ago from a neighborhood that distributes theirs actually via um, email. They haven't gotten to social media yet, so they just send it as a PDF via email to people. And it serves the same purpose, also gets it there pretty quickly too. And of course, you can share it uh, using your social media. There is a button there that you select in order to share it and make it available to people. And I always suggest that you have a newsletter archive just for the sake of preserving some of your history, some of the things you've uh, covered in the past. Uh, next slide. We have some city resources that you can use to gather newsletter content. Um, and of course, you can go to the county website as well. But since I'm with the city, that's the one that I focused on. I included the link. So when you get a copy of this presentation, you can click it and go to the government homepage. And also on that homepage, you'll see something that shows you how you can join the mailing list. Uh, we have on that web page, the home page, news and topics, and we also have an events calendar. That might be where some of you saw the um, post about this workshop. Also, housing and neighborhood services in our community engagement division, we have service area teams, and those members submit, send out newsletters um, pretty frequently that have information of interest to neighborhoods. And of course, um, our department also has uh, social media platforms, and we have included that information a little later on in the presentation. Uh, turning it over to Hillary. 
Hi again, everybody. So um, just really quickly, we want to run through some tools that can help you put together your newsletters. Uh, one of these, of course, Chad mentioned, he showed you the, the app for Canva. You can also access this on your um, desktop computer or your tablets. Um, Canva, you can sign up for it for free, but they also do have some um, things that you can uh, pay for or just to kind of increase your access to different design tools. So Canva basically is a, an online design tool and um, you can use it to create different social media posts, um, presentations, posters, videos, logos, and all kinds of different things. Um, they have a lot of really um, just graphically, visually pleasing templates to kind of browse through and they do specifically have some for newsletters if you're looking to um, kind of uh, beef up or get a new look for the newsletters that you're uh, sending out to your community. Then um, next, one of our most basic tools that um, hopefully most of us have access to, if you don't have access to Word at home, you can always go to Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. We have uh, Microsoft Office um, tools available on our public PCs, um, but Microsoft Word actually has a few newsletter templates that you can just go in whenever you create a new document. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the back end, you can um, search for newsletter templates and you know you can just kind of scroll through select which one you want or you can create your own custom templates um, with those tools in microsoft word let's see um, and the next one that i'm going to talk about specifically for newsletter creation tools and also a sharing tool is um, just your basic google account that you can create for free so uh, with your Google account, of course, you have access to Gmail and Google Docs for free. Um, and one of the cool things that you can do with Gmail is you can create a Google group that allows you to store all of your neighborhood contact information for your neighbors. Um, like if you have their email addresses or names or phone numbers, things like that. And um, you can then also use Google Docs to create newsletters. Again, they have some um, templates that are available for you to kind of use as a starting point. Um, and then you can save those in your Google Drive. So just wanted to, you know, mention that Google has some tools that are free and accessible to you to kind of store your information and create those newsletters to send out to your community. And then next, um, we just wanted to kind of um, touch on some marketing tools. So um, I just wanna give a disclaimer that we're not promoting any of the tools that we're mentioning tonight. There are just some that we know that some of our neighborhood groups do use. Um, the, this first one is MailChimp and they had a lot of, really, uh, a lot of free tools that you could access um, and uh, kind of wanted to highlight that one first. So um, marketing tools just offer you different benefits that help you build a strategy for reaching the individuals in your neighborhood. Um, build a following and communicate in a variety of different ways. Um, so most of the ones we'll mention have um, tools that allow you to build email contact lists, websites, um, they have web hosting, newsletters, and um, the ability to manage social media posts all from this one site. Um, so MailChimp is one that you could look at because they have a lot of these free tools, including like surveys and um, you know, social media management for some of the tools that we talked about tonight. Um, on this next slide, again, just really briefly, don't wanna to go too far in deep um, with any of these, but there's some of the um, common marketing tools that you may have heard of. Um, Con Contact is a digital and email marketing company, and they have um, some built-in tools to help you create um, email lists and create newsletters and send those out um, pretty easily. And you can store all that content in there. Um, Bluehost is a web hosting company with a lot of built-in marketing tools. Um, and I should have mentioned some of these have some free options to use them. And some of them have paid plans. You would just need to kind of do a little research on what you and think about what your community needs and how you want to communicate with your um, with your neighbors and, and evaluate whether that's something you would really wanna dive into. 
Um, and then Send in Blue and HubSpot are again just some digital uh, digital marketing companies that have some of those built-in tools that you can that you can use. <clears throat> and then um, next we wanted to highlight some of our resources and training. Um, I'm going to have a slide, and then Cynthia is going to follow me with some additional resources as well. Um, at Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, we do offer DigiLit classes, both online and in-person. Um, DigiLit is our brand for our digital literacy classes, which is our computer and technology classes. We have um, entry-level skills that we teach, um, as well as um, some more intermediate level skills. So if you go to our website at cmlibrary.org, you can search for our calendar there or you can go directly to, oh, I didn't go to the next slide, I apologize. This is what I'm looking at. You can go to cmlibrary.org slash calendar and um, search for a DigiLit filter and that'll bring all, all of the classes that we have available. If um, you're looking to learn more about social media, we should have some of those classes coming up in the next few months. Um, we're working on revamping our curriculum for those and getting that available for you. Um, we do offer a Canva class. Um, I believe our next one is full, but please double check the calendar and sign up for that. You can get on the wait list for it. And then we're adding new classes all the time. So definitely make sure you check that out. Um, another one of our great resources um, that's available to you for free, all of this is for free, um, uh, is North Star Digital Literacy Assessment. So um, North Star Digital Literacy is an assessment and learning tool um, that's designed to assess the skills you need to perform tasks on um, computers and online. Um, so they have self-guided modules um, that kind of um, assess your ability to complete those different tasks um, for things like Microsoft Word or using social media, um, just like your basic computer skills. Um, so it's definitely a great resource to check out um, to kind of see like where you're at and then where you need to focus on um, either improving your skills or if you've mastered them, what you can do is you can schedule a project assessment with one of our library employees and you can actually earn certificates. So if you want to have continuing education credits or not, not uh like a continuing education um, proof like to your employer or if you're job searching and you wanna add that to your resume, you have that option. And again, you would just go to our website and uh, you can create a free account there. Um, another one that is super popular is uh, LinkedIn Learning. I highly recommend this one. Um, just to note that you have access to it for free with your Charlotte Mecklenburg Library card. Um, so if you're a resident of Mecklenburg County, um, you can sign up for a library card for free. Uh, there's more uh, information on our website for doing that. And we also have an online application where you can apply for a card. If you do live out of county and you still want access, you can apply. And there is just, um, I believe it's a $45 fee for out of county. But if you have any questions about that and want to contact me after, I'm happy to answer any questions about how to get your library card so you can access LinkedIn Learning and all of our other great resources. Um, but this one, you would want to go to the library's website um, to, in order to log in to access it for free because it asks you to type in your library card. Um, but there are so many video tutorials on, um, you know, setting up Facebook, Instagram, Canva, like you name it, there are free courses and video tutorials. And you also have that ability to earn the certificates and add them to your resume or, um, you know, show your employer that you're continuing learning or if you just want to learn for yourself. It's there. Um, and then another one that I highly recommend is GCF Learn Free, which you don't need a library card for this. You can just go directly to their website. It's a Goodwill Community Foundation resource um, that has tons of free courses, um, especially social media. Um, you know, so you can, you know, if you're a beginner or looking to learn more or are looking for different tips on how to do things in your social media accounts, it's another good place to start. So with that being said, I'm going to go to the next slide and hand it over to Cynthia. Thanks, Hillary. Just a couple more things about resources. Hillary uh, reviewed some resources for training um, 
learning more information, more how-to information, I wanted to make sure that all of you know about our Neighborhood Matching Grants Program that's operated out of the Housing and Neighborhood Services Department. This is a grant program for eligible neighborhood-based organizations to help fund neighborhood projects. Um, it's You see matching in the name of the program. Um, the match, that's the good news, the match, however, can be made with volunteer labor, in-kind donations, or cash. A lot of neighborhoods um, get funding for projects, and um, if they're short on cash, they make up the match in volunteer labor and, and other contributions. I did uh, touch base with our Neighborhood Matching Grants uh, program manager to see if something related to social media might be considered for funding. Um, and she did say that they um, projects might include use of social media, including marketing and branding, uh, programming, organizational development, um, all of which might have some social media um, content. I included the um, link there. There's loads of information on the website. Um, something to let you know is the next grant cycle is September 1st. And uh, every time we're approaching a grant cycle, we will advertise Neighborhood Matching Grants pre-application workshops. So check out our events page on the city's web, uh, website um, and you can get that information and be prepared. Now I will say that um, in order to get funding, you need to have an actual project, an outlined project. It's hard to fund an idea, so you need to already have done your research, uh, know what you need, know what you're going to do, and how are you going to get it done. Uh, you can also follow us uh, using these social media platforms that we've, we've mentioned, and uh, you see it listed there, how you can uh, tag us, link to us, and get the information you need. With that, last call for questions. We went over a lot of information and we went through it pretty quickly. I think we did a pretty good job of fitting it into an hour and a half. So if you still have questions, you can still post them. If you think of something later, you can email me. I'm Cynthia Woods. My email address is cynthia.woods at charlottenc.gov.